get it. Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, over-the-air affiliates like KMAB, 99KMSR, the Mightier 1090, and our new friends at WYOH, 1540 in Youngstown, Ohio. Maybe you're listening on podcasts, replay on Sirius XM, or maybe you're video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. And if you are, you'll notice I'm not here right now. We are working on that as we speak. But however you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully wherever you are, it's sunny outside. And even if it's not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. Overcast day here on my portion of Delmarva. But as long as the sun is rising before 6.30 a.m. as it has been, I'm not going to complain. Spring is around the corner. What is also around the corner... Paradigm Pro's Hoosier Hysteria card. That's where our own filthy Tom Lawler is in Jefferson, Indiana. It is tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Triller TV. He faces off against Reed Bentley in a match that's been five years in the making. I know that because in the card that they sent out about the match, it said it was five years in the making. But we got a lot of news to get into today, even though Filthy is not here including the announcement today that brother-in-laws Mike Rotunda and Barry Windham will be joining the WWE Hall of Fame as a team. Barry Windham is already in the Hall of Fame for WWE. He was inducted along with the Four Horsemen a couple of years ago. The ringer today was chosen by WWE to reveal this news. The U.S. Express is what Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo were known by in their time in WWF. They'll be inducted into the Hall of Fame next month during WrestleMania weekend. They are going to be the third act that has been confirmed for the Hall of Fame class Joining Paul Heyman and Bull Nakano, Paul Levesque shared a video on social media today where he informed Rotunda and Wyndham of their induction. And I do wonder if this now opens the door for Bray Wyatt to be inducted this year into the Hall of Fame as well. As I mentioned, a ton to get into because there is a ton of news and a ton of events going on this weekend. We'll get into as many of them as we can when we get back on Wrestling Observer Live. Which way he was headed? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Shoulders. been here.
It's Vinny straight jacket. You're getting close. Back on the show, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi here with you. You know we do this show right now, right here. See, this is how I'm all screwed up now, but the video is back, so that's all that matters. And we do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day. But if you want us 24-7, you can try to find us on Twitter slash X. I am at Sempervivi. Filthy is at Filthy Tom Lawler. The website is at W-O-N-F-4-W, and the broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. Jim Valley is at Jim Valley. He'll be here with you live on Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And Andrew Zarian is at Andrew Zarian. He's here with you on Sundays starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Of course, I would also love for you to make the wrestling news part of your day. Everything you need to know to get your day started, get you up to date, or get you to your favorite long-form review pod like Wrestling Observer Radio. There should be a new episode of that up for subscribers tonight with Dave Meltzer and Garrett Gonzalez. Each episode of the Wrestling News is between 5 and 15 minutes long every single day and is usually posted at about 9 a.m. Eastern Time. No clickbait, no speculation or rumors, just the Wrestling News. Find it wherever you find your favorite podcast or head on over to the WrestlingNews.com and at Wrestling News AV on Facebook and Twitter. WrestleMania 40 may not be the only match that Dwayne The Rock Johnson works in 2024. So says Dave Meltzer this week in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which is also available right now for subscribers. Meltzer reports that while nothing is set in stone, the belief right now is that WrestleMania will not be the only time The Rock wrestles in 2024. There is a push to get The Rock to work at least one of WWE's Saudi Arabia shows this year. Meltzer writes the WWE's next Saudi show is scheduled for Saturday, May 25th, and that there are a lot of variables and factors in play, but WWE would obviously like it if The Rock worked that event. No kidding. I'm sure the country of Saudi Arabia would love to have that as well. It's just a matter of getting The Rock over there. It'll be interesting to see if he does go. It will also be interesting to hear the reaction from people if he does go over because of all the real-world issues that still linger from the Khashoggi incident and all the claims of sports washing, like through Live Golf and all this other stuff when it comes to Saudi Arabia. But uh, again, they would probably love to have The Rock there. Obviously, TKO would love to have The Rock go over. be interesting to see if Saudi Arabia ponies up a bunch more money for him to come over there. Regardless of where it takes place, I don't think it's that big of a surprise that the Rock may work one more than one match in 2024 because we have the obvious one that needs to take place, which is Roman Reigns and The Rock, which, in theory, you could easily hold off until next year. That's in theory. In reality, what will The Rock be doing? What is The Rock's career path with the movies what exactly is he going to be doing so that may be a lot to ask for it's also a lot to ask for out of a guy that you know we, we talk about the torn ab muscle or, or whatever it was when he came back and wrestled at wrestlemania a couple of years ago we saw him get blown up fast obviously this is going to be a tag match with a lot of a heat so you know it's not going to be a lot on him but a one-on-one -on -one match against roman reigns it's a little bit of a different story and it'll be interesting to see whether you want to try to get to that maybe by SummerSlam. that might be the best way to go about it as opposed to waiting until wrestlemania but we'll see one place where we know we will see The Rock is tonight on WWE SmackDown, which is live on Fox from the American Airlines Arena in Dallas, Texas. Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins will answer the challenge of The Rock and Roman Reigns for a tag team match at WrestleMania. Also on the show, United States champion Kevin, or I'm sorry, Logan Paul, 
it will be there. And Randy Orton and Kevin Owens have been looking for him. So that looks as if it will be the, the match for WrestleMania, at least to me, it seems like that's the obvious choice for the match with WrestleMania because with Randy Orton and Kevin Owens, yes, they are both baby faces, but with their personalities, with the history that they have and with the cachet that they built up with the fans obviously fans will be fine with these two punching each other in the face as long as both of them get to punch logan paul in the face by the way we didn't get into it yesterday even though brian teased it but i cannot wait for mike tyson uh to punch jake paul in the face there it's funny to hear all of these people out here for a 58 year old mike tyson and for jake paul and the fact that this is the paul's promotional company that are, are putting this on that that think this is going to be a quote-unquote real boxing match it's, i you know I, I think tim zoo and keith thurman are going to have one of those in a couple of weeks you'd be better off watching that if you're looking for real boxing but bobby lashley will also be on the show facing off against carrie and cross bailey i will assume because that's really that's all that's been announced so far i checked a little bit before we went on the air but not much else has been announced but Bailey will probably be on the show answering Dakota Kai and, and going after Dakota Kai, I would assume, for Kai turning on her last week and staying with damage control. L.A. Knight and A.J. Styles still hate each other. They got to figure that out. So hopefully, bottom line is, hopefully we get this road to WrestleMania kind of paved with some matches here because, you know, we're a month away and... I'm not going to get into it like Brian has with AEW, but let's start laying out some of these matches. If we're going to do Jimmy and Jay, let's start getting it shaking here. Same thing with Lashley and Cross. You know, what are we going to do with, with those units? You know, are they going to be facing off? They probably are. Let's just go ahead and announce it and start building towards it. Bianca Belair. What is Bianca Belair going to do? I hope she's not part of some just some gimmick multi-person match to get her on the card. She should have a feud of some note here leading into the show. So let's start getting it moving. Speaking of WrestleMania 40, <laughs> I, and I never, I, I, I got to be honest, I never thought I would see this happen, but WWE has entered into its first ever Spirits sponsorship as Wheatley Vodka has become the official vodka of WrestleMania 40, according to to the Sports Business Journal daily marketing newsletter that they send now that came out on Wednesday. No financial details were revealed, but the reporter Terry Lefton noted that Wheatley will also serve as the presenting sponsor of a yet untitled six-part content series that will feature Cody Rhodes interviewing other WWE wrestlers and will include a Wheatley-branded tour bus. So we've got a new American Nightmare tour bus a coming, I, I guess, with Cody Rhodes stepping off of it to interview people, so... Uh, surely a big windfall for TKO and WWE that way. In fact, TKO's Executive Vice President of Global Partnerships, Grant Norris Jones, is quoted as saying that the company is also actively pursuing an official beer sponsor. I guess Mike's Hard Lemonade doesn't fall into that category. I guess that's their official hard seltzer sponsor, and they are coming back for SummerSlam. Last October, WWE's sister company in under the TKO umbrella, the UFC, inked what was reported to be a six-year, nine-figure deal with Bud Light, the largest in the history of the promotion, so... I have a concern, and I I was in the beer, wine, and spirits industry for a long time on the retail end of things. If you're old school, you know, we're in an old school area on the package end of things for a long time, and there was one I was working at, and we would always try to get in new neons and mirrors to put up so we could, like, you know, take the neons and mirrors that we wanted and take them home and, you know, either put them up or sell them off or do whatever it is you're going to do with them. A lot of times when it came to the real neon ones, it was end up breaking them in a move. And then you can't, there's so much to try to get them replaced. Real pain in the butt. But I had a, an old manager who would walk in, an old owner of a, a place that would walk in and he would look around. And it's just like, it looks like a whorehouse in here because of everything that was hanging up. And I have concern about that when it comes to WWE. Granted, they have been doing this in Japan for years. You see it in Mexico. If you watch CMLL shows and other shows, 
all of the advertising on the ring mats, in the corner, on the ropes, everywhere. I'm old. I'm not sure if I'm ready for that in WWE or anywhere else in American wrestling. I know some indie promotions do it, GCW, all that sort of stuff. I don't know if I'm ready for this in WWE, but guess what? It's coming. Oh boy, is it coming. A lot more news to come as well, too, including SmackDown not airing on Fox so much in the fall. Wrestling Observer Live. What made you make that leap, though, from, from gymnastics to pro wrestling? Like, what happened there? Yeah, so my story is a little different. So I was finishing up my fifth year at Michigan State in gymnastics, and I got a message on Instagram from the WWE recruit page um, asking me, hey, would you like to come to a tryout at SummerSlam? This was the Nashville one, so in 22. And at first, I'm like, is this real? Like, there's no way that WWE is contacting me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. So I went down to Nashville. I did the tryout. And thankfully, I was blessed with the opportunity for Triple H himself to offer me to come to the Performance Center and start training. And that's how I got into pro wrestling. I never would have thought in a million years that I would be a WWE superstar. So being here is so surreal. How has that training been like for you from going from gymnast to pro wrestling? Yeah. So I will say it's very very different it's foreign to me but then again the physicality of it is helps me a lot because i'm able to catch into the small details easier i would say just because in gymnastics everything is based on perfection so i have to make sure i know all the details i have to make sure the margin of error is very small so i believe that helps me in the ring with like body control details just making sure i'm aware um, i have air awareness so I believe gymnastics has helped me, but then again, it's still different because I'm not used to having someone hit me or being in the ring with someone else. In gymnastics, it's just me by myself. What was first day of training like for you? Oh yeah, first day of training. So learning how to just control your body with like safety, like rolling and stuff, that was the easy part, but hitting the ropes the first time was so painful and just learning how to bump and stuff. That was probably the most painful thing the most difficult thing ever yeah and the easiest like you said before was just having body control and i will say like coming from an intense sports background and into pro wrestling being mentally tough is something that I, was instilled in me when i was younger and that's been able to translate because you have to be mentally strong in this industry so who have you studied oh yes absolutely so starting with in ring wise i would say rvd is someone whose style i absolutely love I love also how authentic he is, how unapologetically himself he is. And that's something that I want to strive to be. I want people to be able to relate to me. And then also Bianca Belair is someone, because she's so elegant, but she's also so powerful. And even she has this sass to her where she doesn't let anyone walk over her. So those are people who I studied. And then for promo-wise, I love hearing Daniel Bryan cut his promos. He's very energetic. And it's cool to see even his evolution of how he started promos to where he was um, doing promos. Oh, Mike Sempervivi, you're with you. I'm all alone. Filthy Tom Lawler in Jefferson, Indiana right now, getting ready for tonight's Paradigm Pro show, uh, which is available on Triller TV for those of you with subscriptions there. And you're going to have a busy weekend if you're a subscriber to Triller TV. Uh, we'll see how much time we get into, but uh, GCW this weekend, a couple of other shows as well. But we'll stick right now uh, to the WWE and... They made a lot of money off that Wheatley deal. Yay! Sazerac Brands. That's Southern Comfort. 99 Bananas, that's who that is. You know, they have like Buffalo Trace and Pappy Van Winkle and all that stuff. Not as good as it's hyped up to be. Okay? I'm just I'm telling you, for the money, you can get better value elsewhere. But that's got nothing to do with this next story. Unless you're Fox and you believe that you can get better value elsewhere out of your Friday nights. And... 
<laughs> it's just some things like, with some good news, like the the big money they made out of here. This is this isn't that bad. This is more of a a kick to the the crotch, I guess. This is more of a an ego shot more than anything. But Fox Network announced yesterday that it would be broadcasting a package of Friday night collegiate football games beginning in September. As a result. WWE SmackDown is expected to air those weeks on FS1 as it has been doing and as it will be doing in October when Fox broadcasts the Major League Baseball World Series. In a Fox Sports press release issued on Thursday, the network's president of Insight and Analytics, Michael Mulvihill, yes, the president of Insight and Analytics, Michael Mulvihill, he stated, quote, we've built our collegiate business on seizing opportunities in previously underutilized time slots, first with Big Noon on Saturday and now on Friday nights, end quote. This past February 16th, only a couple of weeks ago, WWE SmackDown on Fox became the first professional wrestling program to ever finish number one for the week on network television they ain't having it fox has not been they look and i we talk i've talked about this a lot when things were coming up about where they were shopping smackdown but they promised fox a one and there's been a lot of times where they've promised things not come through and been able to hit people with bs or because of their great relationship, like with Bonnie Hammer, it didn't matter what they hit because everything was going so well with NBC that, hey, whatever. Uh, Fox was not having that. And they obviously saw a hole they could punch through on Friday nights. The NFL is obviously an absolute monster. College football right now, it's not as big of a monster, but it's going to be especially as it continues to basically contract and we're going to end up with probably two conferences at some point that are essentially going to be bid on like they were college like like they were professional football you know the rock has been trying to get the XFL back or whatever they call it now you know it doesn't matter the NCAA is the real minor league for the NFL and the more that NIL becomes a thing and the less that the NCAA aspect becomes a thing, the more value is going to be put on college football. And that's obviously what Fox sees on Friday nights. Big 10, Big 12. Obviously, you saw what Deion Sanders did at the University of Colorado. Got the So I'm wearing the Coach Prime sweatshirt today. Any game that's not on Big Noon on Saturday, any game that's not in prime time, well, it's probably going to be right here. So going to be a rough road for wwe not like it really matters at the end of the day they're still getting paid what they were going to be getting paid anyway but you lose the visibility that you have on fox you use, lose the ability to try to tout being the number one show on all of television for a week when you get pushed to fs1 bad optics there i guess some people could say not really but yeah, yeah football is bigger than you that that is it is an optic what's also an optic is Mercedes Monet believing that she'll be back in WWE one day and saying that, and then, you know, that would be a bad optic to me. And <laughs> this is what Mercedes said, uh, the former Sasha Banks. This is what she said on the Kick Rocks Wrestling Podcast. Quote, I know I'm going to be back there one day, okay? So it's not like it's over, or so it's not over. Like I said, I have a lot of unfinished business in wrestling in a lot of places. Well, it's probably true. Probably didn't need to be said. The line was edited out of the full version of the podcast, probably because she or somebody said, hey, you know what, I probably shouldn't have said that. Take that out. And they did. But they left it up when they posted it up to YouTube, which if you want to see it, the full version is available when you go to the front page of the site and click on the story. Just go to WrestlingObserver.com. It was part of the answer that Monet gave while explaining why she walked out of WWE. 
She left WWE after an episode of Raw in May of 2022. She said something inside of her told her she needed to stand up for herself, though walking out was the hardest decision she had ever made. It's also the decision that she is most proud of. So, again, it was probably a very honest answer. It was a obvious slip up that somebody caught and again, took it out of the podcast. But just, just a reminder to everybody out there to just try not to say it in the first place. Cause it kind of, again, you know, people are going to have, and there's going to be a lot of people anyway that have a clock on her and her time with AEW, just waiting for it to run out because they're not AEW fans as much as they are Mercedes Monet slash Sasha Banks fans. And they want to see her back at some point in WWE. So oops, <laughs> when it came to that one, another story on optics. Although this one was really more for Japanese executives. That, that's what I think. According to a report from Tokyo Sports, the newest AEW signee, Mr. Kazuchika Okada, has inked for three years at a reported $13.5 million. Now, today, in the newest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave reports that Okada has signed for three years. Yes, but the real number is substantially lower than the $4.5 million per year average that Tokyo Sports has reported. But, <laughs> again, when do you when do you hear about this? When do you really ever hear about a wrestler's money out there? I mean, we hear about it like in drips and drabs here and there. I've been watching slash covering Japanese wrestling for well over 20 years now. I don't remember numbers ever coming out. It was tough a lot of times to get a number of somebody actually started, you know, they started a lot of times. Look, once January was over with, everybody's contract was up. You know, this is how this is how it usually worked. It's only been in the last couple of years we started to have and start to see multiple year deals and finding out information on just how long somebody is signed for. Jay White was a great example of that. Some people said seven. Some people said four. Some people said this, that, and, and everything else. We didn't know. Now we're getting dollar figures reported by Tokyo Sports. I don't know. That seems like it was put out there either by Barry Bloom, by somebody as here you go, Japan. This is what your wrestlers are missing out on. This There's a very baseball feel to this where it's like, okay, this is what he signed for. This is what he's reportedly signed for. And there's probably a lot of people looking at that and wondering, eh, maybe, <laughs> you know, do I have to wait till I'm 36? Do I have to wait? We'll see. You know, with the way things are right now, again, I don't think things are going to be changing too much uh, as the world continues to shrink and there is so much money that is available over here. And it's not like AEW is running out of it anytime soon. They're still going to have a TV deal that they're going to reap the benefits of as time goes on. And it will be interesting to see how many top-level pro wrestlers in Japan decide to opt out and look at it as it's Major League Baseball and want to go over and ply their trade as early as possible and maximize their dollars as early as possible in their careers. So this isn't going to be something that's going away, but I found it very interesting, again, the optic of it, that this number was reported in Tokyo Sports, even though Dave has said eh, it's, it's a little bit high there. AEW Rampage is tonight on TBS with matches taped on March 6th at the Gas South Arena in Duluth, Georgia. No spoilers here. Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta will take on Kip Sabian and The Butcher. There is a TBS title house show rules match or the House of Black rules house show rules match. It might as well be a house show match. Uh, Julia Hart faces a mystery opponent. Penta El Zero Miedo faces Action Andretti. And in a three-way tag match, Private Party against Top Flight against Brian Keith and Commander. Collision was also taped in the same building last night. An Atlanta street fight will main event things on Saturday. Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, and Mark Briscoe against Brody King, Buddy Matthews, and Malachi Black. Brian Danielson against Shane Taylor. Chris Jericho against Titan. 
You want to talk about a guy that is criminally underrated? I think Teton is. Now, watch him again. I know the match was taped. I haven't checked any spoilers or anything like that, so watch him crap the bet or something like this. But Teton is a guy that for a long time has been really good. And when he was facing it off against uh, Hiromu Takahashi, when Takahashi was Kamiyatachi in CMLL, and all that, I mean, he is really, really good. And hopefully he's got a good match here against Chris Jericho. Teton's going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting, that's for sure. And Helico against Mystico and Mariah May will take on Trisha Dora. Got a lot more to get into when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Show Mike Semper BB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Don't know where Brian Alvarez is, but he will be back with Dave Meltzer at some point this weekend for Wrestling Observer Radio, and he'll be right back here with me come Monday on Wrestling Observer Live at 3 p.m. As I mentioned, Jim Valley here with you on Saturdays at 10 a.m., and Andrew Zarian's here with you on Sundays at 6 p.m. Who will not be with you on Collision? Kevin Kelly, who has reportedly been fired by AEW, that is by way of the Pro Wrestling Torch. This story was posted up to our front page of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter today by Chief Editor Joseph Courier. 
Kelly had been an announcer for AEW Collision since the show premiered in June of 2023. After initially serving as Collision's lead play-by-play -play voice, Kelly was replaced in that role by Tony Schiavone last October, joining color commentator Nigel McGuinness. The Pro Wrestling Torch story says, quote, Kelly's performances were seen as subpar within AEW, including Tony Khan, apparently, since Tony Schiavone was called to take over the lead play-by-play -play role a few months into Collision's run on TNT, end quote. Dave Meltzer inquired and was told that the situation was an internal matter. Kelly did not work Thursday night's AEW Collision taping and was removed from the roster page. Kelly had sent out a tweet last weekend claiming that he had been benched in AEW due to being libeled by ROH announcer Ian Riccoboni. In August of last year, Riccoboni made posts on the Voices of Wrestling Discord server that mentioned Kelly promoting, quote, QAnon movies, referencing Kelly's support of the movie Sound of Freedom. Riccoboni admitted that the Discord posts were made by him but said he did not know how Discord worked. Riccoboni said that he should have read up on what was public and what was private, but he had no regrets about the posts. Kevin Kelly, in a tweet that he had sent out, said, and this is on March 2nd, but the idea of what I bring to the table is lost there because Ian libeled me, so I sit on the bench, valued by my peers, waiting to get my number called. I keep asking why but i but i excuse me i keep asking why but i get pushed aside it's okay because there's no one better than me ask the ones that know and they will tell you it has affected my standing within the industry and i want corrective action taken kelly wrote in another tweet kelly began in the wrestling business in 1991 working for eddie mansfield's independent promotion based out of orlando florida the international wrestling federation he got his job with wwe uh, got a foot in the door to WWE because of a former IWF wrestler. Uh, uh, was it Billy Gunn? I think it was Billy Gunn, actually, that got him in the door. It was either him or Hardcore Holly. I think it was Billy Gunn that actually got him in the door there. And then after that, worked as a manager in ECWA in the early 2000s uh, when that company was one of the bigger independents on the East Coast. Also, obviously, his work that he did as an announcer with WWE, MLW, Ring of Honor, and, of course, New Japan Pro Wrestling. So I am sure that we have not heard the end of this story, most certainly have not heard the end of this story. TNA Sacrifice is tonight on TNA Plus from the St. Clair College in Windsor, Ontario. There was no good way to transition into this. Sorry, TNA. TNA World Champion Moose will face off against Eric Young. TNA Knockouts World Title 3-Way, Jordan Grace against Zaya Brookside against Tasha Steeles. World Tag Team Title Match, Ace Austin and Chris Bay against Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards with Alicia Edwards. She's great. I'm sorry. I love the Eddie Edwards, Alicia Edwards act. I really do. TNA Knockouts Tag Team Title, Masha Slamovich and Killer Kelly against Danny Luna and Jody Threat, Nick Nemeth against Steve Macklin, Josh Alexander against Alexander Hammerstone. I'm actually lo really looking forward to that one, too. And a six-man tag team match, Mustafa Ali and the Good Hands against Chris Sabin, Kevin Knight, and Kushida. They have also added a no disqualification match for tonight, PCO against Khan. So that's been added to the show as well. I'm not sure about any pre-show or anything like that, but that is available on TNA+. Plus. I think I talked about this last Friday, but Hard to Kill ended up doing 19,700 buys on television pay-per-view, which was more than double what they did for Bound for Glory. Uh, which did under 6,900 on television, and that was considered large. Uh, Dave in the newsletter said if you factor it in the streaming buys, it ended up at around 60,000, which would be equivalent to what Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle did at TNA Genesis in 2006, which set the record for the company. But as he also mentioned, it did not lead to... Ticket sales picking up. If you look at the ratings for Access TV, they really don't vary at all. And sometimes they, they widely vary, which is, you know, you can you can throw pretty much all of those ratings out there when it comes to Access. Now, how they're doing on TNA+, Plus, that's all that matters. How much money that they can continue to bring in by putting on a, a pretty darn good product. Again, 
there are a lot of options out there. TNA has turned itself around into becoming a, a much better option. At least it had been. Now with Scott Demore right not there anymore, we'll see how things go. But this is probably going to be a good litmus test tonight. Number one, for how the show is received. And then obviously for how many shows or how many buys that the show does. Game Changer Wrestling returns to the show boat this weekend in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I'd like to be here for that, but I, I can't be. I'm going to just be down the coast here doing what I got to do, watching it on Triller TV, which is where both shows will air. Saturday, the Ashes to Ashes show, Nick Gage against Ryuji Ito, Matt Tremon against Abdullah Kobayashi, and what will surely be a scientific encounter for the ages. A strat match between Mance Warner and Effie as Mance Warner's diabolical deeds continue in GCW, just breaking up the whole second gear crew. Just, just the terrible things going on there. Dan Housen against Charles Mason. Yes, I said that. Dan Housen against Charles Mason. One is very evil and very nice. One is very evil and very evil. Tony Deppin against Microman. John Wade Murdoch against Brandon Kirk. Blake Christian and Shane Mercer against the Garbage Daddies of Alec Price and Cole Radrick. And for the GCW Tag Team Championship, Violence is Forever against Dark Sheik and Sawyer Wreck. I would love to see Violence is Forever against Filthy Tom Lawler and Davey Boy Smith Jr. I don't think we're going to get that match. I would like to see that match. Sunday, GCW, so much fun. Joey Janela against Jack Cartwheel. Brandon Kirk against Micro Man. Six-person tag team match. I think I can say this on national radio. Thrussy will face off against Maki Death Kill Club. Maki Ito, Matt Tremont, and Nick Gage. So that's a hell of a team. Uh, Alec Price and Cole Radrick against Charles Mason and Richard Holiday. Abdullah Kobayashi and Ryuji Ito against Ciclope and Miedo Extremo. John Wayne Murdoch against Casey Cattell. And GCW World Champion Blake Christian, who you see lose on Ring of Honor TV a lot. All you do is see him win in GCW. He faces off against former GCW champion, the woman he won the title from, Masha Slamovich. He did that last June 4th. He has had 36 successful defenses of the GCW world title. I don't know how many Nick Gage had, but that has to be close to the record. I, I, I don't know what the, the plan is with Blake Christian. I don't know who the person is that ultimately takes it off of him. But tonight, Masha Slamovich, 37th defense. CMLL is also tonight, as they always are, from Arena, Mexico. The catch with this show is it is their first ever all women show inside Arena Mexico celebrating International Women's Day, CMLL, 91st year of business. They ran their first all women show ever, Amazonas del Mundo, on October 25th, 2022, at the Arena Coliseo in Guadalajara. And then they had their first ever all women show in the city of Puebla last October 30th. The main event for tonight, La Harachita and Luvela against Andromedia and Scotty. Scotty? I don't know about her. But Andromedia was, uh, she was wrestling for Triple A and just left and ended up in CMLL. Uh, she and Scotty again face off against Uvela and La Harachita. Dark Silhouette against La Catalina for the CMLL Japanese Championship. I forgot they even had this belt. They brought it back in September after it was dead for years, but technically Dark Silhouette is the champion. Reina Isis against Azusis for the Mexican women's title. The Copa Irma Gonzalez, the Irma Gonzalez tournament will be taking place, and they have another match on there as well that is taking place tonight at Arena Mexico. Again, the first ever all women show in the history of that building. Speaking of women, Stardom's 10th anniversary Cinderella tournament kicks off on Saturday inside the Budokan in Yokohama. First round matches Hanan and Hanako. Yuzuki and Starlight Kid, Momo Kogo and Zena, Koguma and Ruaka, Saiida against Saki Kashima, Yuni Mizumori against Lady C, Sayaka Kurara against Natsuka Tora, and Miyu Amasaki against Rana Yagami. Eight women, including Mirai, all received buys in the first round. Mirai has won the tournament in back-to-back -back years. She was the first person to ever do that. 
Other women who got by, Suzu Suzuki, Mei Sierra, Ami Sorhei, Wakasukiyama, Hazuki, Azumi, and Mei Sakurai. The second round of the tournament will take place on Sunday at Korokan Hall, and the finals will be coming up on March 20th in Nagoya. I guess if I had to handicap this right now, I don't think Mirai is winning three in a row, that's for sure. Azumi probably is, you know, the funny thing about Azumi is I don't think if you, if you were to take Azumi right now and say you're facing Julia or you're going to take her and say, okay, you're going to be in a title match here against Micah, people would buy it. I mean, people are already, I don't know if she necessarily has to win this tournament. I kind of would like to see somebody like an Hazuki win this tournament because again, I don't know if Azumi necessarily needs it. But again, if this is about optics and you believe that she needs to win a big tournament and to kind of, you know, make her case that she's here for 2024, this could be a good way to do it. Also on the show, Natsupoi will make her return after being sidelined since October with a cervical disc herniation, basically a bad neck. She'll team with Sari Ano against Sari and Chihiro Hashimoto. Leading into their NJPW Strong title match, too, Julia is going to team with Suri and Konami to take on her opponent for that match, CMLL Stephanie Vaker and Momo Watanabe and Fukikin Death. So that's what that's, and again, for those people who are unaware of the Cinderella tournament, Tony Storm has won it, Julia has won it, Mayu Iwatani has won it as well, too. Mirai has won it in back to back years. New Japan's New Japan Cup is continuing. I didn't even see what the results were for today because, you know, it doesn't matter. It just seems like everybody's bracket is, is busted anyway. Jack Perry's going to win this thing, isn't he? Just, just to drive me nuts. Jack Perry's going to end up winning this thing. But that's going to continue. And, and again, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not bullish right now on what New Japan is doing. I... I'm willing to to sit and see how things go. I have no other choice. I have to do that, but I'm not enthralled right now. I do get a kick out of seeing Jack Perry with House of Torture just because he is going into Chicago where he was going to be hated anyway. I guess you might as well go ahead and stick him with that unit, but I don't know if anything can save anything with the House of Torture at this point. Just light it on fire, kill it, let it be dead, and then, you know, get rid of of David Finley, make him a baby face again or something like that and just roll hard with the Bullet Club. Please do that with the War Dogs and I'll be a happy man. Also taking place this weekend, in fact, it's going on right now, Germany's WXW promotion running the annual 16 karat gold tournament taking place. We'll have results on that on the wrestling news. Hopefully up on the website of Wrestling Observer too, but we'll see how that goes. Wrestling Observer Live, we'll be back. But here's the thing. Afterwards, we had this big momentous moment where you were confronted by none other than Nick Nemeth, who was making his TNA wrestling debut. I want to get your thoughts on uh, Nick Nemeth coming into the company. Oh, um, even though he took me out, which I'm going to get mine back when the time is right. Um, but let's leave that alone. Um, but let's talk about Nick coming to the company. I think it's huge for TNA. Obviously, um, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, he's a superstar. I mean, he he's he's done everything in professional wrestling. He's been a world champion. He's been a tag team guy. He's been a he's won every single title you can think about. He's had it. Um, he's been all over the world. Um, he has a he he um, he has a huge buzz going right now. And for him to pick TNA over AEW and New Japan or any other company he's working, that shows that TNA is a, is a hot spot right now, right? Um, so I'm happy he's part of the team. I'm happy I get to do something down the road with him. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that TNA is is starting to be a, a spot where people want to come to. Same thing with Ash by Elegance, um, her picking us over of a company that's out there. Um, I'm happy she's part of the team, and um, I can't wait to see what um, the future brings with 
Nick and Ash. And my last question to you is dream opponents. You're the champ now, man. You know you're going to have everybody coming after you. Who are some of the opponents that you're like, let's go. I need to get a match with this person. Oh, man. The first one that comes to mind is not – he doesn't even – it's not a full-time guy in our company, but we kind of had a um, had a preview of the tapings in Vegas with Okada. Um, he's a, a guy I would like to have another one-on-one -on -one match with. It's been six years since I had a one-on-one -on -one match with him. I was a kid. Um, actually, it was more longer than six years. It was I've been wrestling for ten, so it was nine years ago because I was one year into wrestling when I had a singles match with Okada. So I was a kid. I was I was a, a kid in wrestling. So I would like to have another one-on-one -on -one match now that I'm a adult in wrestling. And I would like to see how that plays out. Be here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. No Brian Alvarez, no filthy Tom Lawler, just me. Me and producer Daniel, who just reminded me that we are springing forward this weekend. I completely forgot about that. I was happy in the opening segment. Like I said, I am, am getting older here. I am extremely happy now. That the sun is back out before 6.30 in the morning. Now I'm going to be in, even happier because I live at the beach. And the sun is going to be coming up at 5.30 in the morning come Monday. Now I'm going to miss that hour of sleep. That is for sure because, well, I got all this wrestling that I'm going to have to watch this weekend. Look at all that stuff I ran down. What are you going to be watching this weekend? Going to be interesting here. GCW, again, I still think is when it comes to the... Other category when it comes to options, I still have more fun watching GCW shows than anything else. I don't expect to see the finest in scientific professional wrestling. I don't watch it for that. I watch it for the fact that a lot of times it's a big old fat happy car wreck and I get a kick out of that. I get a kick of the people that they'll bring back and, and feature like Ricky Morton and doing things like that and, and Tracy Smothers, you know, working for them for a long time before he passed away. I'd love seeing all that sort of stuff but as i mentioned tna has been pretty good and you're talking to a guy that did not want to say that i wouldn't even give them a chance because i spent so much money and so much time over the years watching them on weekly pay-per-view and all these other things but my god uh just again th there's other options out there and it sounds like it, it, very faintly that the music is coming to a close because it's not turned up in my ears right now. But because of that, that must mean we're at the end. And I, if I do say so myself, I did a, a solid job of filling two and a half minutes while I didn't have anything else to say. And since there is nothing else to say, I guess I will thank Producer Daniel. I will thank Producer John. And I will thank all of you. We shall talk to you again after a while.